Hi, everyone. This is Eleanor with Eleanor's Elite Radio. Beautiful day here in Melbourne, Florida. We're actually going to feel some beautiful, cool weather, hopefully soon. I'm here today with two very special, wonderful gentlemen. Uh, One is Phil Scarpelli. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Brevard Family Partnership. And the other is Mr. Jim Carlson, uh, currently the Senior Executive of Public Affairs. Uh, Both of the gentlemen have been here for quite some time, and we're going to get to know a little bit more about what Brevard Family Partnership does for our community. Hey, guys. Nice to meet you. Hey, hello. Hi. Hi, Jim. Great, great. Uh, So let's do a little chatting. Uh, First, Phil, tell me a little bit about yourself, how you got started. Oh, geez. So... Many, many years ago, I uh, got my graduate degree in clinical psychology, and I worked at inner city New York with at-risk children and families. And uh, shortly thereafter, I came down here to Florida in 1990. And uh, Florida was in a sort of a renaissance of change with regards to their child welfare uh, industry. Uh, the government did just about nuts to soup on everything in child welfare, from investigations to foster care and the like of services that support that. But then that radical change was occurring around 2000, where the government, through legislative act, was transferring a lot of these responsibilities to the private sector. So uh, we, amongst many agencies throughout the 67 counties here in Florida, uh, became what's called a lead child welfare agency or a community-based care organization that took on all of the services to children and families who were at risk. And I became intrigued because I came here to do behavioral health services to at-risk families. When I heard all this change in child welfare, uh, I was recruited over, quite frankly, by one of the lead agencies who took on foster care, adoptions, and independent living, all the services that work with kids who have been removed from their families and such. And uh, since then, it's, it's been quite a journey. Uh, it's quite humbling. Uh, I really wanted to impact lives, and given this opportunity with Brevard Family Partnership, we're really working with thousands of families every year. How wonderful. Mr. Carlson, can you uh, shed a little background on how you got started and how you got involved with uh, BFP? Sure. Uh, um, My family and I moved to Florida in uh, 1995, and... uh, in September of 95, I started uh, working for the state uh, Department of Health and Rehabilitative Services, which mm. is uh, the old, it was a consolidated uh, department that included juvenile justice, child welfare, and the departments of health. And uh, soon thereafter, the, de- the state split them up into their own unique departments. And uh, I transferred, transitioned to the Department of Children and Families. I was a foster care worker for a number of years and then worked my way up through the uh, through leadership positions. I ended up being the contract manager with the state that uh, brought community based care of Brevard into being. I can remember uh, calling around to different counties to find um, uh, what are known as TANF funds, TANF matching funds, in order to have funds available for this CBC to uh, get up and running. Um, I started here in 2006 Mm -hmm. uh, as the uh, uh, chief operating officer. I did operations for eight years. I then transitioned over uh, to the administrative side and uh, and now have the good fortune of working in uh, marketing, public relations, and contracts. How wonderful. You know, Eleanor, it's really interesting. As I'm hearing Jim talk, you know, <laughs> he and I actually go back a long ways. Wow. When I arrived in Florida, I came into the private sector. He was with state government. And I remember, it's funny, interesting how you went about community learning. I went to his agency, the Department of Children and Families, to meet a, a sundry of different people to understand Florida's system. Mm-hmm. And he's one of the fellas that I got to meet and help me understand how Florida operated. So we go back a long ways. It's funny how our paths have now united us together. In Isn't this that amazing? Yeah. I feel that's always another higher power plan, uh, always work out, yes. that people at the end always come together for a reason. Yeah. Um, Phil, let me ask you, uh, fostering has sometimes a little negative connotation attached to it. It has for many, many years. Could you tell, tell the audience why children come into fostering first? How did they come into the system? 
Well, by and large, the children that come into foster care are, are products of families that are breaking down. Mm. And, you know, the common variables in homes across the nation, not just here in Brevard County, mm. are dealing with mental health and substance abuse mm-hmm. issues and domestic violence. And these children are in these homes where there's a lot of risk to their safe, safety. And so the state, who still does protective investigations here in Florida, goes in after a call has, sub- has been submitted to the hotline, uh, saying that there's been an allegation of abuse, neglect, and or abandonment, and sometimes even exploitation of children. And so it is the state and the courts that determine that a child becomes imminently at risk and therefore services have to be offered. Families could be working, we can be working with families in home with moms and dads if we can assure that there is safety for the child to exist with mom and dad. But at the same time, mom and dad need to work on what they call a case plan to mitigate those uh, original allegations that something isn't right here in this home. Right. So, so ultimately, is the plan is to get the children back into the home with their parents. Absolutely. absolutely. That's always the number one goal is reunifying children with parents and to ensure that they can be sustainable, self-sustaining beyond our services. Right. And how long of a project is it, let's say, for one typical child who happens to fall into the uh, foster care system? Does that depend on the case plan for the parents? Certainly, it's uh, there's a number of variables that will determine how long the system is involved in the life of the families. But the other variable is the willingness and participation of parents in uh, services that are uh, rendered to them, and and more often than not, court ordered. So uh, you know, the federal laws are saying that we should be working towards a 12 month limitation on making sure that everything that the system has to offer mom and dad to mitigate those issues that brought the family to our attention. But at that 12-month mark, there's kind of a push now for some time through federal legislation that uh, if they cannot get their game together and mitigate those uh, risky circumstances in the home and provide the safety and uh, uh, the, the, the basic needs of this child, uh, then what will happen is the courts will determine that a concurrent plan will be ordered, which is says, Mom and Dad, we want you to win this child back right, into your home right. safely. You and, want to make and, it as easy right. as possible. But if you don't, that the courts are realizing that foster care in particular, it's an interim state. A kid should not be left in limbo no. for too long. No. And, and, and healthy attachments need to be occurring. So what, off, what will sometimes happen, quite frankly, a very small number of the relative number that goes to a hotline for investigation, a very small number, is where the consideration of a child's removal occurs. An even smaller number after that year mark is a consideration as to whether or not we need to have a secondary plan, and that will often be the termination of those parental rights. I think that's very important to know. I think a lot of people think that once a child gets into the system, it's years and years and years. No, they have a case plan that the parents must follow, and if in case they don't follow that plan is when other things have Mm -hmm. to come into matter, correct? Yes. Okay. Actually, I'd like to interject that this past year... Um, 58% of the children that had been removed uh, were uh, ha- had a permanent solution within 12 months. Brevard actually led the state in that area. Wow. And um, so, uh, the, you know, we have a program that works well. The, the, they work well with the families. There are times that the judge has discretion to allow it to go beyond 12 months. Of course. Uh, you know, there may be instances where if there's substance abuse and, and, and other treatments that uh, the parent may need four to six months just to sure. do, deal with the <clears throat> exactly. substance abuse and then get going on the others uh, to make sure that, they, that those other services are of value. Right. Can I ask like a little bit more of a personalized question? What do you think in your past life or your past younger life that brought you to want to be so involved in helping families and children for both of you? That's a great question. You know, um, the first thing that comes to mind is that I think my life's journey, although it wasn't all easy, I lost my mother as a child and I had my father in a large sibling group to grow up with. And, but I had a supportive family and a, so what we call a supportive network, natural network of people that were with me throughout my life journey as a young person, 
through you know all of the ups and downs that were there to support me. You know, I find that with our families that we work with, many of them don't have, if any, natural support. So think about it. You know, being uneducated or maybe being a victim of abuse or neglect right. yourself uh, when you were young and now you're adult raising kids and, and then dealing with kids with special needs. You know, I honestly believe there but for the grace of God could be any one of us if we didn't have those supports exactly. or education exactly. and whatnot. So. It's the compassion of knowing how blessed I was with my life's journey, with the recognition and education and experience that I got through my, my journey in this career that says, you know, these people can be helped. So much can be mitigated and remediated, and people can uh, become self-sustaining once again. And that brings a lot of joy. Uh, to me and, and to my colleagues that work with me uh, in this organization. Absolutely. How about you, Jim? Any kind of personal background, how you came? Um, not like that. Uh, you know, I had a typical Midwestern childhood, the young youngest of four, three older sisters, so I had a pretty easy childhood. <laughs> <laughs> easy? Are yeah. you sure that was the oh, no, It was use? because... Uh, you know, they broke my parents down, and I just rode right through. <laughs> um, that being said, um, um, when I became, uh, you know, in 95, when I started working and then uh, working in foster care, it was very important to me to uh, to be very respectful to the children and to their parents. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the parents would, uh, would harbor anger about the children being removed, you know, and, and it was it became very important to me to listen to them. Everyone has a story mm-hmm. about what you know what happened, and 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 within their own narrative, there there are things that I could uh, uh, see and accept and validate for them, and I, I really thought that it went a long way. Um, I, I really did. I had the the good fortune of uh, I've had the good fortune of of remaining in touch with many of the young men and women have sought me out in my uh, leaving there and uh, have sought me out on Facebook and just want to tell me thank you for the, you know, the, my work with them and that they're doing well. And, you know, that resiliency and strength of character is, is, is all the reward there really is. I can see how hard the both of you, how everybody here at BFP yeah. puts their best effort to helping the children mm-hmm. and the families. And it is, it's very endearing because, you know, for myself, I've been waiting over a year to be a part of a uh, Brevard Family Partnership. I yeah. just wanted yeah. to be so a part of it. <laughs> no, we're glad you're here. I am too. I'm so glad I'm here. Yeah. I want to go back to the stigma that's attached. Right. What are some of the myths that are uh, attached with fostering and adoption? Well, for one thing, you know, who's a foster child? You know, is this is like a question I'm often asked in the community. Who are these kids? Like yeah. they're a big mystery or an alien from another <laughs> planet or something like that. They're children. Right. They're children just like yours and mine. And uh, the, the, the significant difference is their entry into this world was very, very different in many situations and fraught with a lot of challenges and, uh, and shortcomings. And therefore, as we know about child development, uh, you know, negative behaviors... A negative experience often manifests itself in, in maladaptive behaviors. But let me tell you something. Uh, I've worked with uh, these kids. I've worked with the families that work with these kids, these foster families. Uh, and I think one of the greatest myths is that this is something that the average person couldn't handle. When in fact, all they need is love, attention, uh, and, and regularity about how life and days and functions happen within a home. And they really come around, some at different times and some in different uh, places. But uh, the foster children are really children who want structure in their lives. They don't articulate that. Of course not. They want Mm -hmm. the love and affection, and they want uh, stability. Mm -hmm. And then the other myth is really who are foster parents. If I had a dime for every time someone says, oh, are they doing it for the money? I said, you have no idea. Mm -hmm how little money they get to do this, but how much personal reward and gain. I met with some families last night that were both foster and adoptive, and we talked into the night, literally till 9 o'clock at night at a support group meeting. And you know, as much as I can speak in this interview today, 
I was silent because I was humbled by what they shared. Yes. It brings meaning to their life time and time again, and they often will.